the end of the day, people are going to believe what they want. If you want to believe in a world where demons are real and your faith may or may not have any dominion over them, that is your choice. I think it makes far more sense to question, get the facts, and go from there. And the fact is that nothing that happened at 112 Ocean Avenue on the supernatural side of things has ever been proven, and quite to the contrary, much of it has been debunked. He says, we're not in the habit of blaming Satan for every phenomenon. And I'm like, well, they're not evangelicals, are they? No. <laughs> because this is a big thing in the circles that we moved in. God wasn't more powerful than the spirits slash demons, ghosts, whatever you want to call them, that had control over that house. They thwarted any religious effort to quell them at every turn. These demons couldn't be controlled by priests. And if they could go so far as to stand in the way of religious intervention, what is anyone's faith actually worth? Welcome to Unbound, a podcast for new atheists and lifetime atheists, ex-evangelicals, truth seekers, and free thinkers. There is life after faith. And life here is good. It's time for a new perspective and a better conversation. I'm Spider. And I'm Shell. And it's time to get Unbound. It's the ultimate case of the better story. Demons and voices and red-eyed monsters will always get more play than a story about a guy who bit off more than he could chew on a house with a price tag that was too good to be true. I'm Spider. And I'm Shell. And tonight, on Sow and Eve, Ooh. we are rounding out Unbound October by taking apart the movie The Amityville Horror. And hopefully we'll be able to show what happens when you mix the ramblings of a discount con artist with buyer's remorse with a cultural zeitgeist that is too easily influenced by bloody tales of supernatural terror. But before we get into that, just want to let you know that our next episode is going to drop on December 17th, and we'll be reviewing Emmett Otter's Jug Band Christmas. Then, on New Year's Day, it's New Year, New You 3.0, which is basically our annual end-of-year roundup and a little bit of encouragement for pressing on in a world that always wants you to look back. Yeah. At your faith, at the decisions that you make. And we're going to offer you just another few words of encouragement about how you can continue on this path of staying unbound into 2023 and beyond. From there, things remain a little wide open, but we will have a more comprehensive roadmap of where the show is going by then. I'm feeling better. Things are starting to normal up just a little bit more, but the time element is always going to be a thing. Yeah. And like I said last week, it's time to kind of regroup just a little bit. And by the end of the year, we will have a better idea of how we're going to format the show because I do absolutely want something that's going to be consistent so that you guys know when new content is coming and we have the capability of delivering what we're promising. Right. So that is is a very important thing to me and we're going to be working on that and we'll have more to say about that once we get to the end of the year and have a clearer idea of how we need to do things to keep this moving and like i said we're not hitting anyone up for money at this point patreon is still up there if you have the notion to make a donation it's still available to you but we're not going to be playing that angle as heavily as we were right i think that consistency is an important element to something like this and there hasn't been much of that lately, and I know it. Just enjoy what we're doing. Tell people about it. Make sure that you're giving us those likes and shares and five-star ratings and all the things that help podcasts grow, because we are now on episode 127, and there's a lot of meat in the content that we produce. And again, like I said last week, I think there's plenty here to work with, and plenty of people who can benefit from the messaging of all of these past episodes. So keep sharing the content. Keep telling people about us. We're not going anywhere. And we'll have a better roadmap for you in a couple of weeks. So with all of that in mind and bypassing Christians behaving badly yet again, <laughs> we're going to dive right in and start taking apart this train wreck <laughs> of a movie. So the first time I saw this movie, I think it was around 1981 <laughs> and it was running on HBO and my mother and I were visiting with a couple of her friends. They had a couple of teenage daughters who were definitely old enough to handle this. In 1981, I was what, nine years old, Something I think. Like that, yeah. Nine years old. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching this movie and it's freaking me the fuck out. Like yeah. around every turn. 
I didn't like the red eyes. I didn't like the doll with the red eyes. I didn't yeah. like the stuffed animal with the red eyes. I didn't like the red eyes in the in the windows. I didn't like the rocking chair that rocked on its own. Yeah. All of the things that showed up later in different sources because those were the scariest bits of the movie. So, of course, they showed up in yeah. other places as well. But this was my first time seeing any of it. And it terrified me as a child. No nine-year-old needs to be watching this movie. Like zero <laughs> nine-year-olds need to be watching this movie. But there I was. And... A lot of this stuff followed me for a lot of years. There was imagery that really bothered me even after I got into reading Stephen King. But I was uh, I was also exposed to a lot of the media attention oh, that yeah. the movie that got. Was, that was like pre-Blair Witch. Yes. Social. Well, just by just a little bit, yeah. Just a little. You know, but it was also that kind of thing where they were saying it was a true story. Now, Blair Witch, they really didn't say that, but they didn't really not say that right Blair Witch was more of a war of the worlds kind of thing yeah where it was supposed to be understood that it was fiction but a lot of people didn't understand that it was fiction it was freaky yeah very freaky freaky. I had a hard time watching that movie in theaters too I don't want to get off on too much of a tangent right but it was a difficult movie to watch for a number of reasons Uh, the the camera work being the biggest one But it was also scary enough that I wanted to go and see it as a matinee. I didn't want to leave the theater at night. You know what I mean? Mm. But keeping things on track with the Amityville Horror, I remember seeing all those scenes that I mentioned on shows like That's Incredible and then In Search Of. They lied to Mr. Spock. How could they? Well, they lied to a lot of people. I know, but... And they just handed him a script. I know. Okay, so. I have no beef with Leonard Nimoy oh, God, no. over any of this. I mean, this this was a guy who was hired to do a job and he was doing the job. Yeah. And that was it. But I do think that they presented it to him in a way that was, let's just say, less than honest. Yeah. Just a little bit. And as I was watching this, years and years later, I started thinking about parallels between this story and things that were said when we were investigating the Pierce Mansion, right. the haunted Victorian and Gardner. Um, I also think that there are parallels to the reasons why some of these things got inflated to the point that they were. You know, I don't know for sure if the people at the Pierce Mansion were lying or if they really believed that they went through what they went through. I gave a little bit of my theory on that in our episode a few weeks ago about ghost investigations. So you can go back to that for a little bit more on this particular subject. But I do believe that there were parallels and there may very well have been more than what I thought of originally, because as I'm watching this movie, I'm thinking, you know, we're talking about two families that found themselves in a position of buying way more house than they could afford Mm -hmm. because they got a good deal on it. And I think that there are specific reasons why certain things happened in both instances. So, of course, the Amityville Horror was based on a book that was written just a couple of years earlier, the full title of which was The Amityville Horror, A True Story by Jay Anson. And it's yet another example of how thin the concept of truth can be when placed in the wrong hands and how blindly people believe anything when the phrase true story is tagged onto anything. Yeah. The first thing that I noticed was that they went out of their way to make this beautiful house look really, really ugly in the beginning. It was supposed to look menacing. The light coming out of the windows of the top floor had this pinkish sort of hue to it. And that was definitely on purpose. Lots of thunder and lightning because, you know, thunder and lightning are scary. Of course they are. So... At the beginning of this movie, whether it has anything to do with anything or not, of course it's going to be raining and storming because thunder and lightning are things that ghosts and demons and evil spirits kind of like. I guess. And it it sets the stage for a good horror story. So after, after a very, very brief rolling of the opening credits, we see the house again and now all of a sudden there are police and rescue all over the property. And this is what comes up on screen. It says November 13th, 1974. Mother, father, and four children murdered. No apparent motive. Okay, so this actually did happen. Yes. There's record of the DeFeo murders actually happening in this house at that time. Right. And it really was just a couple of years before the Lutzes moved in. And I, <laughs> I saw some of the people that were in this movie, and it's like, 
I didn't think about it at the time, obviously, because it was years before some of these other movies came out. Yeah. But you've got two people from Back to the Future. <laughs> were, yeah, right. We're in the beginning of this movie. And the first thing that I noticed is uh, one of the detective guys was Principal Strickland. Yeah. And all I could think of is him standing there looking at the house going, who did this? Whoever it was, he was a slacker. <laughs> but there was so much more. It's like I'm watching this and I'm thinking to myself, how many 70s police drama stereotypes can yeah. you fit into a single scene of a movie? Because they used all of them. Yeah. They made sure that we understood that this was serious shit and the police were on top of it and all of that. But then all of a sudden it's one year later and now we're going to meet George and Lois Lane. I mean, George and Kathy Lutz and yeah. they are newlyweds and they're absolutely enthralled with the house. And now the house looks gorgeous oh, sure. in sunlight. It's a beautiful house. And here comes the realtor, Miss Save the Clock Tower herself, <laughs> is trying to sell them this house. And I'm thinking to myself as they're doing their walkthrough, and we're seeing the grounds and how gorgeous it actually is right. on this property. I'm thinking to myself, you know, I'm not going to lie here. I'd buy this house, and I'd buy it right now. Oh, man, yeah. If I won the Powerball <laughs> this week, I would be watching Zillow <laughs> to see when this house went on the market, because I yeah, would want it's... it beautiful it is it is and i'm sure that at this point in time probably it needs a lot of work oh yeah it's a very very old house it was an old house when the lutzes bought it yes and that's going to play in a little bit too and i got to chuckle out of what the realtor says here she says there's nothing like it on the market not at this price and i'm like well that's probably a good thing but there's also probably more reasons for that than just what happened there. Right. And yeah, you know what? The value of a property can be impacted when something like this happens. Yeah. But it's going to be impacted financially, not spiritually. No. And no. Uh, there were no previous accounts of demons or anything like that. Mm -mm except for the rantings of the guy who committed the murders, who said that he heard voices telling yeah. him to kill his family. And that could have been something that the Lutzes then latched on to later. Right. For a, a number of reasons. They, they could very well have used that as the basis for everything that they told the press and anyone else who would listen about what they quote unquote experienced in the house. But the realtor is doing her regular realtor thing and George makes her a little uncomfortable by telling her that they have kids. They're newlyweds. Right. And they've got older children. And yeah. in 1979... Oh, yeah. It was still a big bugaboo. It was. It was kind of a taboo thing. And she's trying really, really hard to just gloss past that part of the conversation. <laughs> and George is kind of getting a kick out of it. He's got this shit-eating grin on his face because oh, he yeah. knows that he's making her uncomfortable. So as they do their walkthrough we start seeing flashbacks to the night of the murders. And as they open a door, blam, the gunshot. And you see, you don't really see a whole lot of blood. You don't see the murders happen, but you see everything that surrounded these murders. Right. And every single time they open another door, we're told this is what happened in this room. So that builds just a little bit of tension. And then we just go back to this couple looking at this house. They're up there in this beautiful, nice, wide open attic. I would love to have a house with an attic like that. Oh, I know, right? It would provide more living space. A little. When we were looking to buy back in 2009, I remember looking at a house that had a layout in the attic that was just like this. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, oh, I totally want this. But there were a lot of parallels between that house and the Amityville house. Right. And there was something in the back of my mind kind of saw it then, but I wasn't terribly worried about it. You know, yeah. even though I was kind of predisposed to believing some of this stuff, I didn't really worry about it. It did stick in my mind that it was an older house with a lot of history, but that was pretty much it. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking that at least at this moment in time, that's how they're looking at this house. They know about the history. They have been told what happened there and they don't seem terribly phased. No. At the very beginning, they don't seem like they're bothered by the fact that this happened. They're more thankful that they're getting this gorgeous house for like $40,000 less than market. And that's really what they're focusing on at this point. 
so George then asks if they can just sort of wander around on their own. And, you know, at this stage of the game, you don't want your realtor hearing your thoughts. Right. Because if you seem too enthusiastic, it can impact what they decide to uh, to present to the buyer in terms of an offer and whatnot. And it also impacts their commission. If you're going to be overly eager, then you want to be overly eager in private. Yeah. So this is what they're doing. And they're talking about how much they like the house. And they're trying to keep their poker faces in front of Save the Clock Tower. And I don't think they even actually tell us what the real offer was, but it was in the realm of about $80,000. Yeah, that's what the house was going for. Yeah. Because they couldn't sell it because these things had happened. and They might have lowballed them a little bit yeah. and got a little bit better of a deal on it. But $80,000 in 1979 was still pricey. Yeah. Um, it's a beautiful house in a ritzy neighborhood on Long Island, but it was it was a lot of money. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, just to put it in perspective, when we bought the house in New York back in, I think, I want to say it was 1982. Right. Very, very nice house. Lots of space. Almost an acre of land. Huge in-ground pool in the backyard. The whole nine yards. I think that they made an offer of like 68000 for. Oh, my. Okay. So and that was only a couple of years later. And right. in a neighborhood that... I mean, it wasn't neighborhood association nice, but it was definitely suburban nice. Yes. And that's kind of how I see the house on Ocean Avenue here. It was a nice house on a nice plot of land. They were right down by the riverside. There was a boathouse, all kinds of amenities. Yeah. So all of these things are going to up the price tag. That's for sure. And this price tag was really, really small in comparison to other houses in the neighborhood. Yeah. So they did what they thought was a good move, and they just jumped on it. I don't even know how many houses they had looked at, if this was the first one that they saw or what. But they jumped on it because they thought they were getting a good deal. And they even discuss the murders for, right. for a, a brief moment here. And George makes the point that houses don't have memories. So in the beginning, he's thinking rationally about this. He's not looking at it in terms of, well, the place might be haunted. That's not even a thought in his head at this point. Right. So they buy the house. And the whole thing with the kids is true. We finally meet them. To clarify, she has kids. Right. We don't know too much about Kathy's past at this point. I didn't bother to research her past or anything like that. No. I'm, we're dealing with a movie here. But these were her kids. And they called him George and all of that. Right. Started out calling him Mr. Lutz and he hated it. Yeah. And uh, they got to the point where they were calling him George. The next shot, he's holding up a crucifix and asking Kathy what she wants to do with it. And, you know, she tells him where he wants it hung and he hangs it. And the establishment here is that Kathy is a good Catholic girl. Yeah. She's already made arrangements to have the house blessed. Yeah. And, uh, and that's something that is just about to happen. She's struggling with contact paper. Oh, I know. The she's, not, she's not having a good time getting these no. shelves papered up. And nope. then, for whatever reason, we've got this long, slow zoom in on the crucifix. It's like, okay, Jesus on a stick. We get it. What's happening next here? And then here's the answer. Here comes the priest. And the scene at this point with him standing there at the door yeah. was like the beginning of Poltergeist 2. Except yeah. this guy wasn't as creepy as the priest in Poltergeist no. 2. Not by a long shot. No. And... For whatever reason, he just decides he's going to let himself in the house. Yeah. He doesn't tell anyone that he's there. And they're all outside. He can clearly hear them. And he knows that they're there. But for reasons the movie never explains, he's just going through this house like he owns the place. Right. He's walking through every room and doing his priestly thing and never has any interaction with the family while he's there. Weird. I mean, he's doing things that I think are a little bit strange here. Like, he's trying to open a window, and it won't open. It's like, dude, why do you need to open a window to bless the house? Bless the house and fuck off. You know, that's <laughs> that's all you need to do here. And he can see, literally see, that they're all outside. But he's on a mission. He's there to bless the house, and he just goes around and does his thing. And... I remember him taking out his little equipment yes. bag and all I could think of is Hillary Fay and saved. It's like, don't have my equipment. <laughs> I'm ready to accept Jesus. Oh, well, okay. I, I don't have my equipment with me, but let's do this. 
And that's all I'm thinking is that, oh, look, he had his equipment with him. Of course. He can, he can bless the house. It's going to be jesus up really, really nice by the time he's done. And the thing that gets his attention while he's doing this is that there are a lot of flies. Yeah. Flies, flies, and more flies. And Padre is just a little bit put off at this point. We learn later that his name is Father Delaney. And he is just, he, he's getting visibly nervous. He's starting to look visibly ill. And then he says in a shaky voice, God's peace in this house. And I'm thinking, yeah, yeah good luck with that. <laughs> and Delaney's getting more queasy by the moment here. He seems dizzy. He seems disoriented. He looks like he's about to puke. Meanwhile, the Lutzes are all outside having fun on the water while the flies take up residency on the priest's head. Yeah. Now they're literally touching him and that's skeeving him out even more. And then a door opens on its own and Delaney is thinking something is a little bit amiss. And then there it is. This non-corporeal voice saying get out get out and he hears this and he heeds he's still a little nauseous but he obeys and at that moment i'm thinking well so much for greater is he that is in me yeah. you know <laughs> and and that's going to be a running theme through this movie the spirits are a little bit greater than the religious people and that's an important point that we're going to examine a little bit more at the end too and I'm thinking, did these people even know that he was there? And we find out later that no, they really didn't because she calls back later to try and reschedule with him yeah. and was told that he was already there. So why he wouldn't at least on the way in or out, you know, I understand on the way out, he just wants to get the fuck out of there at that point. But why not just let these people know he's there? That part of it was always just a little bit strange to me, mm -hmm. but it doesn't really have much to do with what's going on in the movie. It's just that I think in terms of the overall story, it was supposed to communicate just a little bit more of a layer of mystery. Right. Because the reality of it is that a priest did actually bless the house, but they knew that he was there when he did it. And the only other communication that they ever had with any member of the clergy was by phone. And the conversation happened, and that's significant based on things that happened just a couple of minutes here. Right. Now it's dinner time, and Amy, who is the daughter, they got two boys and a girl, and the daughter is basically comatose. Yeah, that is the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Yes, and the boys are perfectly normal. They've got that eight- or nine-year-old energy going on. Right. And they don't seem bothered by the fact that their sister is a little under the weather. It's kind of like in The Witch, where no one seems to notice that the twins are basically worshipping Black Phillip. Yeah. It's like no one notices and no one cares. And now Father Delaney is trying to call to, I guess, let them know that he was there or to kind of warn them. You know, some strange shit happened when I was at your house and we yeah. should probably talk about it. But he tries to make the phone call, and the phone is acting really wonky, all kinds of static. Kathy picks up the phone, and she can't hear anything on the other side. It's all static. He's trying to warn them, but the spirits in the house aren't letting him warn them. At this point, George is starting to seem a little fatigued, too, and he complains that it's cold. And this is going to be a running thing with him. Right. The cold in the house is something that he finds very uncomfortable. Kathy says that she thinks there's a draft coming up from the basement. And, you know, he's like, well, why should there be? Well, dude, it's an old house. Yeah. The house is supposed to be well insulated. Yeah, well, well insulated houses also have issues with drafts. And this is, to me, the first page turnings of we didn't think this through. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? That's one of the first clues that I got to just how hasty a decision this was. From the moment that they look at the house to the time they move in, it's only a month. And now they've only been there for a couple of days. And George is starting to find things that he doesn't like about the house. <laughs> so bookmark that. Bookmark that. I think it's an important point to ponder. And, of course, Kathy is now noticing that something's a little bit amiss with her husband. He's not acting like himself. And George makes his way back down to the basement with one of the boys following him. There's a spark from the ancient electric system in that house, yeah. and it startles 
the kid, I've not, I don't remember which one it is at this point, but he trips, falls down the stairs, but he's okay. George brings him back upstairs, and Kathy is just kind of primping a little before bed. She's doing all kinds of stretching. Maybe she's expecting things to happen. I don't know. Um, <laughs> George is standing in the doorway, but this time she's really, really startled. And this is going to be another thing that keeps showing up in this movie. It's right. like these people all live together, and yet when one of them enters a room, it's like they all get startled. Yeah. It's like, no, we all live here. It's all cool. And now I'm watching this and it's like, this is like one year after Superman, the movie. Yeah. And she's playing the enthralled crush thing the yeah. same way with this guy as she does with Christopher Reeve in that movie. And then we get this very gratuitous, restrained, but too far drawn out sex scene. Yeah. And it's like, they're spending an awful lot of time on this. We get that they're married and in love. Oh, yeah. But I do think that part of it was to show where they were when they first moved into the house right. and how things started to deteriorate in a very, very, very brief amount of time. Yeah. We go from them being totally hot for each other to him cold clocking her toward the end. There's that. So I think that it was meant to establish that. I just think that there were better ways to do it. But any good horror movie needs a little bit of this. Yeah. You know, and that's why it's there get the audience's attention. There's been a lot of buildup here and not a whole hell of a lot happening yet. Okay, so now we can think about these people fucking for a couple of minutes and then we'll get back to the story. And the way that they just kept zeroing in on her and her facial expressions while all this is going on, I was seriously waiting for Can You Read My Mind to start playing in the background again. Yeah. Okay, that's enough of the Lois Lane references. To be perfectly honest, I feel like that particular role for Margot Kidder was like one of the best for her career. And all the rest of them were like this. And she did other kind of schlocky horror movies too. Right. A lot of what she was in was this kind of thing, but nothing quite as popular. You want to see a really, really poorly done horror movie? Check out The Reincarnation of Peter Proud one day. Mm -hmm. That's another one that she's in. And with all due respect, she pretty much ruins it. And now just in the midst of all of this, Amy walks in on them and she's a little upset. She's saying that she wants to go home. Okay. Well, this is normal kid behavior. They're in a new place. They don't know anybody. There's the homesickness aspect of it that is to be expected of a kid that young. The next thing we see is Kathy closing a window. And I do believe that this is the same one that father Delaney couldn't even open. Yeah. And so there's that little bit of uh, ooh going on with that. And now we see the rocking chair. This is one of the scenes that freaked me out as a kid. The chair starts rocking on its own. And they play that tense building up kind of music that goes along with right. it. And the chair is empty. That's important. Then we zero in on an alarm clock. It's 3.14 a.m. And I'm thinking, yeah, pie time, something happens here. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> and then it flips to 3.15 and George wakes up. Now, what's the reason for this? It happens more than once. Yeah. And the reason we're given is that the murders right. apparently took place around 3.15 a.m. So now George is waking up every night at 3.15. I don't know if we're told that before or after. I forget. But that's the reason why he is always waking up at 3.15, and we see the clock more than once with him waking up. So he gets up and he's getting dressed in the middle of the night. I think that he just decides he needs to clear his head and he's going to take the dog for a walk. But if you listen closely, there's a whispering behind the door. And George opens it, and of course there's nothing there. And then there's the window again, which again opens just fine. Then we go back to the chair. And now all of a sudden there's a doll yeah. in the chair that wasn't there before. The kids are asleep. Kids are asleep, okay? They're, they're not doing this. But there's a doll sitting there in that chair that, not for nothing, looks like the actual, quote-unquote, real Annabelle doll Yeah, that the movies were based on. More of a Raggedy Ann kind yeah. of thing. But it wasn't there before. No. So that's significant. So now George is outside and he's walking the dog and... Our point of view is from the house, and I'm sitting there thinking, are we supposed to glean from this that the evil spirits are watching him walk the dog or what? <laughs> but he comes back inside, 
and lights up a butt because this is the 70s and that's how things are done. I can't imagine smoking inside my house. <laughs> it's just not something I would even think of doing. But, you know, the glory days, <laughs> there he is sitting there in his living room and having a puff. And it's significant to consider that they've been there for all of four days. And George is starting to develop certain obsessive kinds of behaviors, not the least of which being that he takes a liking to chopping cordwood. And I immediately thought of William in yeah. The Witch because George is, he's like consumed by it. And he's also a little bit irritable. This all goes back to him being constantly cold and wanting enough cordwood to keep the fire going. So that's where his obsession with this comes from. It's a little bit more focused than William's. William, it was just chopping wood was his therapy. And that was it. It kind of took him away from the reality of how bad things were. Well, for George, it's just, I'm on a mission here. I need to be warm, so I need to chop cordwood. And apparently he's been chopping a lot of it because Kathy makes the comment that they've got enough for like years at this point. Yeah. Which is probably true, but if he doesn't do something about the insulation in the house, he probably will go through it pretty damn quick. So with this little exchange between him and Kathy, he is a little bit irritable at the beginning, but he comes out of it quickly. But we know, we know that something is bothering him. It's not just the cold. Something is bothering this guy. And apparently Kathy is now expecting people. And at the beginning, I'm thinking, okay, so housewarming? Well... Her brother's getting married, and that's what all of this is about. They're right. they're having everybody over before the wedding. I guess I, I don't remember. Did they do the wedding at, at the house? No. Or, or they were just they sort of have. there. I think they might have. Yeah. In the midst of, of discussing this, we hear some more whispering, and then this time Kathy hears it too. And now we get to hear about Jody which is Amy's imaginary friend, quote unquote. A lot of kids have imaginary friends, especially when they're in this kind of a situation where they've been pulled from the life that they know and they're starting over and their brains will do this to give them a little bit of comfort. I never had an imaginary friend, but I understand where that comes from. And I had friends who claimed to also for various reasons, but it's, um, it's very simple psychology what goes on in situations like this. So did she have an imaginary friend? Maybe, but it right. didn't have the undertone that this is going to be given. Now, Kathy is again, trying to contact father Delaney, but he's not feeling well. According to uh, one of the novices, we get his name a little bit later. Um, and he's a lot younger than yeah. Delaney. So I think his name was Bolin. Yeah. Like Father Bolin. I think so. Um, he was either a novice or he was a much younger priest. And this is where she finds out that he was at the house. But since he never bothered to tell them he was there, she had no clue. So she contacts the church trying to reschedule the house blessing and finds out that it already happened. Right. So back at the house, we're having some plumbing issues. Mm -hmm. There's this nasty black tar coming up from the toilet. And every time... They flush, it's just more of this garbage coming yeah. through. And all kinds of things happen one after another after another in this movie. Now we've got someone else in the house representing the Catholic Church. And this time it's kind of a scary-ass nun. And it takes a little while before anyone notices that she's there. <laughs> but she makes her entrance a little bit more than Delaney did. She's very annoying with the kids. It's like if I was a kid and an adult came up to me and started doing some of the stuff she was doing, I'd be like, could you maybe just fuck off? This lady is like, she's pinching the kids' cheeks. And oh, I'm, that's annoying. I, I've never understood that. I, and I'm no. glad it's not a thing anymore. I am too. I've never understood the point of walking up to a child and pinching their cheek. But... This was, again, 1979. It happened to me more than once. Didn't like it. But it was just a thing. And finally, Kathy shows up. But uh, Sister Face Pincher is now very anxious to leave. She's starting to exhibit some of the same signs that Delaney was feeling. She says, I don't feel well. I can't stay. Forgive me. And Kathy is trying to convince her to stick around. And she is very, very, very insistent on leaving. So she does. And I'm thinking at this point, whatever is going on here, it makes anything Catholic feel like they've gone too many rounds on the tilt-a-whirl. Yeah. Because that's how both of them were acting. They were acting queasy 
and nauseous and uh, and dizzy like they had been on too many carnival rides. That's yeah. what it looked like to me. So now we're at the fifth night in the house and we hear a harpsichord playing in the background. I'm like, uh, did Lurch move in? Yeah, I know. Harpsichord music is another instrument with horror movies from this era. Right. So, of course, we have to have some here. George is practically setting fire to the living room because he's always cold at this point and can't seem to get warm. And it doesn't seem like this is affecting anyone else in the house. It's just him. I think, to be perfectly honest, that it was paranoia because at the very beginning, he's getting a sense of how drafty the house is. He's starting to see dollar signs, having to bring in someone to look at the installation and do some work. And now he's getting a little paranoid. That's what I'm thinking is happening here. But the fire is roiling away way more than a fireplace should. I'm like, it sounds like the house is on fire. Yeah. The Foley editors really needed to step back just a little bit with this. This does not sound like fire in a fireplace. But it was probably also on purpose because a roiling fire that sounds like a house fire is scarier than a fire in the fireplace. Yeah. So just more over-the-top bullshit with this movie. George is uh, exhibiting a little anxiety and unpacking things, you know, talking about how he doesn't want to live around boxes forever and all of that. So she decides the best way to calm him down is just to fuck him because sex solves everything. So they retreat to the bedroom and then a quick jump cut later, we find out that mini George just doesn't want to play. Mm -hmm. So now this builds on my opinion that, he is having growing anxiety about the house Right. that his mind is on other things and he can't even get his mind off the draft and how cold it is in the house or the other things that he's starting to notice to be able to pay attention to his wife. So of course they give up. They say good night. Kathy tells him to turn out the light and they do. And then she has a nightmare and wakes up screaming. She was shot in the head and with that, she immediately falls back asleep. And we look at the time on the clock, and it's 3.15. Okay. So now it's affecting both of them. And she wakes up at the stroke of 3.15, screaming she was shot in the head, which I'm pretty sure was something that happened in the room that they were in. Now we're on day six, a Saturday, and two priests are on their way to the house because Delaney says that he has to get back there. He knows that there's something amiss with the house, and he's determined to fix it. But the car they're in seems to be taking on a mind of its own. It's going all over the road. Both of them are trying to steer the car out of harm's way. He's in the car with Father Bolin, and they're both trying to steer the car out of harm's way, but it's crossing the middle line. It's going all over the road, overcorrecting and all of this, and... It finally goes out of control and the hood flips up. So, of course, they can't see anything now. Right. So all this crazy shit is happening, apparently and allegedly, because they're trying to get to this house and the things that are there don't want them there. So they never make it to the house. This house and Catholic clergy simply don't mix. I guess not. And now we jump to the aforementioned wedding and Kathy's brother is getting married he's at the house and he's counting out the money for the caterer george is not doing well but he's trying man he's trying really really hard to be the stand-up guy here he's the best man in the wedding and he's trying really really hard to hold it together now 30 seconds ago the brother is sitting there counting the money right and now all of a sudden the money's just gone And no one can find it. It isn't in anyone's pocket. It's not on the floor. They search this house up and down later on trying to find this money. And it's just not there. And I'm thinking, well, them's pirate ghosts. They are. I guess. They got their booty and ran off. But of course, everyone's in panic mode about this. And George tries to reassure him a little bit and say, you know, I'll take care of the caterer. It's like the caterer wants cash. Well, guess what? He's getting a check. And either he's going to take it or he's going to leave it. So George is going to front the money for the caterer while they continue to look for the money that he is convinced is still in the house. He's at this point not thinking he's going to be out anything. Right. The idea here is that he's going to write that check. He's going to deposit the cash and all will be well. Well, that's not how it's going to work out. But now we get to hear a little bit more about Jody. 
And the chair starts rocking again. And there's a girl there who's basically doing babysitting, babysitting. duty. Yeah. Everyone's off at the wedding. And it's just this girl, Jackie, I guess she's a cousin or something. Yeah. She's babysitting Amy. I guess the boys got to go to the wedding and Amy is home alone. I don't, I don't know. She wasn't feeling well. Yeah. I guess that's why. Yeah. And she, and she wasn't feeling well from the moment that they moved in. Right. So I guess that's probably why these two are home alone in the house. Jackie, for whatever reason, goes into a closet and gets trapped in there and Amy is just sitting there staring at the door. She's doing absolutely nothing, even though Jackie is going completely batshit because she can't get out. Yeah. The adults are all at the reception, so there's literally no one else at the house, and there won't be anyone home for hours. Right. And George just keeps getting sicker, and you can see it. He's really starting to deteriorate, and he gets into an argument with the caterer and all of that. It's yeah. It's kind of ugly, but transparent to everyone who actually matters and now everyone is coming home and as soon as they open the door they hear the screams from upstairs and they discover jackie in this closet pounding on the door screaming let me out let me out open the door open the door whatever it is she's saying there and she insists that the door wouldn't open for her in a closet with no lock right then they ask amy why she wouldn't let jackie out of the closet And Amy's answer here is a little chilling. She says, Jody wouldn't let me. That was a little bit too much for George. In the state that he was in, he snaps at her and he storms out. And then another chilling revelation from Amy. She says, Jody doesn't like George. Oh, dear. That could be problematic. Yeah. So George goes back downstairs and resumes his search for the money. And I'm thinking, Jody, you thief. What'd you do with that 1500 bucks, kid? And (laughs) it is driving George literally nuts that he can't find this money. He is on his hands and knees. He finds a roll that uh, was supposed to be $500, I guess, in 20s or whatever. Yeah. And he is just, he's wailing, where is it? Where is it? And um, I can relate to this. I yeah. have been in that place in my head many times mm. trying to find things that were missing. But not 1500 bucks that I just wrote a check for that I know isn't good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there there is that. On the heels of all of this, we cut to day eight, a yeah. Monday. And now there's this big conversation going on between the priests and Father Delaney is coming across as crazier by the minute here. Yeah. And I like one of the other priests in this. His name is Father Ryan. Yeah. You know, the actor who plays him is the same guy who is in charge of that real estate development firm in Poltergeist. Yes. Yes. (laughs) And I'm like, oh my God. Mr. Teague. Yes. Does he play a asshole in everything well you know i don't look at him as an asshole here i kind of look at him as the voice of reason to be perfectly honest yeah yeah he says we're not in the habit of blaming satan for every phenomenon and i'm like well they're not evangelicals are they no (laughs) because this is a big thing in the circles that we moved in but of course i I was catholic for the first 13 years too so i've gotten the point counterpoint with all of this from various angles but In terms of a Catholic priest, this guy is more rational and level-headed than average. True. And he makes some good points. So Father Ryan, he's trying desperately to talk Delaney down, and it isn't going well. Delaney has seen too much, or at least he thinks he has, and it's not going well. Incidentally, absolutely none of this has any basis in truth or fact. The interaction between the clergy and the Lutzes was very, very brief. There was one priest that allegedly went to the house to bless it, and there was one conversation that was not eaten up by static, and that was it. So all of this is stuff that was invented for the story and possibly for the movie, and a lot of names got changed too. So Delaney is sitting there contemplating things, the voices in the house, what happened with the car. And Father Ryan is trying so hard to bring some semblance of logic to this, and it's just falling completely flat. Yeah. And Delaney lashes back with, has that become the fashion now to cover up? And I'm Uh, like, 
uh, knowing what we know about the Catholic Church now, yeah, it kind of is. Yeah. It's been the fashion of the church for quite a while. Yeah. So um, why should this be any different? And this is what he lashes back with. He says, I'm a trained psychotherapist, and I'm telling you what I saw and heard and felt was real. I've got a family in my parish that are in real danger. Right. So, you know, kind of good build up for a horror movie. The priest is preparing to act the hero here. Right. But the forces that be are going to see to it that he doesn't. Father Ryan lashes back. He says, who the hell do you think you are? You think your secular education gives you the right to question the church? You haven't told us one thing that can't be written off as simple hysteria. Even psychotherapists lose touch with reality sometimes. Nuncio and I have seen our share of phenomena and never once have any of it turned out to be Satanist. (laughs) So... Father Ryan is a good skeptic. And I think that had anyone paid a little bit more attention to him, then things might have been a little bit different. But I'm also thinking that the next part of the conversation is, let's go over to the house together and I can point out a few things to you. And of course, he's going to do the walkthrough and feel nothing. And then just roll credits. That's the end of the movie right there. Mm -hmm. So of course, um, it can't go in that direction because there's a lot more story to tell here. Delaney is sitting there and he's acting very sullen and he knows that he's not going to best this guy on a battle of wits. And he also knows that he's too exhausted to keep arguing, but he's determined. And he says, the church is my home. She is my strength and I need her now. And that family needs her now. And poor father Ryan, he is trying in this moment to be supportive. So, He just decides this guy's a little overworked and tells him that he should take a vacation. And he says, how long has it been since you've seen your family? So that's, that's a little bit of, of info on father Delaney that, uh, you know, could explain a a thing or two about a thing or two with him also. But the two older priests in the room, father Ryan and father Nuncio leave. And that leaves father Bolin with, Father Delaney. And Bolin is kind of standing behind Delaney and he's holding his peace through this whole thing, but he has seen things. Right. And I just feel like at that moment, he didn't want to escalate yeah. anything. And there's never anything from Delaney about why didn't you back me up or anything like that. Delaney is so fixated yeah. on what he's experienced at this point that it's starting to eat away at him mentally, like big time. So now we jump back to the house and there's George out in the yard chopping wood. Yeah. And one of George's employees, his name is Jeff, shows up and his girlfriend Carolyn is there and she is a little put off by the house. I thought immediately of your reaction when we drove by the haunted Victorian the first time. Oh, yeah. She has the same kind of visceral reaction when they roll up to the house. Yeah, she's like, I'm not going in there. No, but she changes her tune a little bit uh, down the road because then she gets certain thoughts in her head. Yeah. But... At that moment in time, I don't think she has any real interest in going inside. So George is still becoming more and more irritable by the day. And there are things at work that seem to be amiss. He has been neglectful of things at work. This is the type of thing that does happen when you have a major life event. It's They just moved into this house and there's a lot that's going on. And I can certainly see a couple of small things falling by the wayside here and there when you're in that kind of a transition. But apparently this is going a little bit beyond what Jeff is comfortable with. Right. We find out that he bounced the check to the caterer, which we pretty much expected. That was kind of a gamble. An IRS agent has been snooping around the business. He owns Mm. a surveying company. And these things are not good. George doesn't even know what day it is at this point. He hasn't signed his payroll checks. There are other things that are being neglected at work and things are just not going well at this point. And Jeff is getting very nervous. In the meantime, Amy is chastising her dolls. And I have to wonder if she assigned personalities to all of these things. And I also have to wonder why Jody would tolerate being talked to this way but you know it's childhood fantasy more than anything else and in any logical context that's how you're going to see it 
And it could also be a coping mechanism because you remember that scene in Mommy Dearest? Yeah. Where Christina is going off on the dolls because she can't go off on her mother? Yeah. Well, I think that parallels with what's going on here with Amy, mm -hmm. is that she's releasing her frustrations on these dolls. And of course, the boys being boys are kind of harassing her a little bit. And then, ouch, one of the boys gets his hand caught in a window. And this time, the window doesn't want to open again. Mm. But there's weirdness with this. I mean, oh, yeah. what's to be inferred here is that the kid offended Jody. So Jody decided to teach him a lesson. And he gets his hand caught in this very heavy old window. And they can't get the window to open when they finally do. And it looks like there's going to be a few broken fingers for little Greg here. But, but, no. As hard as that window came down on his hand, it was basically, I guess we we're supposed to see it as a warning. Okay. Right. He didn't break a single bone. He just got scared. And, of course, everybody else was scared at the same time. That window came down hard. Yeah. And it amazes me that it didn't do more damage. But I guess in the context of the story, it wasn't meant to do more damage. You know, <laughs> it was just a yeah. warning. It was Jody telling him to shut the fuck up. That was it. Amy can talk to me like that. You can't criticize her for it. So Kathy is very put off by this. And she's trying to talk to George. But George is, he is kind of mentally shutting down and he's pretending to be asleep and not answering her. He's turned away from her in bed and pretending to be asleep so that he doesn't have to have that conversation. And then a few hours later, around 3.15, George, now actually asleep, starts awake. And we hear the buzzing of flies. He seems to think that he's hearing something. So he goes to have a look around. He opens one of the bedroom doors and finds the source of the noise. And there are all the flies, like everywhere thousands of flies all over the place and some of them are inside some of them are outside on the window pane trying to get in and then for no reason whatsoever the front door of the house just blows off like the place had been bombed no rhyme or reason for this whatsoever and of course they think that someone tried to break in so they call the police amy shows up all nonchalant and George kind of snaps at her. And again, we hear these murmurings of how Jody doesn't like George. Yeah. Or at least that's what I was hearing in my head. Is that you're going to antagonize this kid to the point where Jody is going to lay some smack down on your ass. Okay. <laughs> George goes and checks the window again. And nope, there's no measurable reason why it would have closed on Greg like that. The window for, for an older house, an older window in an older house, it's working just fine. Right. And he's desperate for answers and he's not getting them. So in the course of events, the cops show up at the house again. This is another thing that never actually happened. But the cops are back at the house. They have no clue what happened to the door. And apparently the basement door is a bit of a mess too. And there's the dog again. You know, I'd almost forgotten about him. But uh, the dog is distressed and he's in the basement, scratching at a specific part of the basement wall and whimpering. The dog's name is Harry. And Harry apparently, quote unquote, knows something. But now we jump back to the cops who have shown up to investigate what George is calling a break-in. And one of the cops asks him if he's had any other vandals or trespassers. And George gets real defensive. He says, what is that supposed to mean? And the cop says, well, your door was broken outward, Mr. Lutz, from the inside. You know, burglars break in and you've got a front door that was broken out. So, yeah, very strange. And George is getting more irritated by the moment here. And he says, let me tell you something. Somebody managed to break into my house, heard me coming and then took off. Now the police, they know that they're dealing with someone who's just on this side of rational so they're starting to yes him just a little bit, but not really. They're trying to insert logic into right. the conversation, and, and it is just not going well. No. So one of the other cops says, okay, then who broke the lock on the basement door? George says maybe they came through the cellar and went out the front door, which makes absolutely no sense. So one of the cops looks at him and says, do you think it was faster to break it down instead of opening it it's like why would they not just open the door and leave 
And this is getting George way, way more irritated. And, and Kathy is kind of starting to lose it now, too. They didn't have very much luck with the conversation with the police. There's really nothing to report or investigate here other than the fact that a door was broken. And there's no sign of any kind of forced anything. It doesn't look like a robbery, burglary, home invasion, whatever. It doesn't look like this at all because of the, the situation with the door. So everybody leaves and Kathy is finally starting to succumb to all the craziness. And she says, what's going on? We have to do something. And next scene, Kathy and Amy are talking about Jody. I think at this point, Kathy is trying to get to the bottom of a few things and she's starting to put the pieces of the puzzle together a little bit and she's upset and Amy is telling her not to cry. And she assures Kathy that Jody says that everything's going to get better. Kathy asks her what Jody looks like. Is she little? Is she big? Is she fat? All Amy says is that she's nice and that she tells her things. And Kathy asks, like what? And Amy says, she tells me about the little boy who used to live in my room. He got hurt and he died. And of course, now Kathy is starting to freak out because how would she know that I, I'm guessing they didn't tell the kids about the grisly murders in the house yeah. that they're living in, but somehow Amy knows. So this is starting to become a little bit more real to Kathy at this point. George is now doing something. This scene's a little fuzzy what he's up to. I think he goes to a library to try and do some research right. on the house and Kathy will do the same thing a little bit later. But they don't develop that very much. All, all we see is him kind of walking through a row of books. And then in the next scene, he's on his motorcycle and he's heading to a bar. That's about as much as we know of what he's actually up to. But Kathy decides she's going to try once again to call Father Delaney. And he finally answers. But then the static on the line returns and they can't hear each other. Delaney is not doing well. He is deteriorating mentally and he is deteriorating physically. Yeah. Now there's enough of a breeze blowing through the house that is strong enough to blow Kathy's hair back. And someone's at the door. Who is this guy? The neighborhood welcome wagon? He doesn't look like he lives anywhere near there. And it's one of these scenes that just seems a little bit, you know. Weird. It just seems a bit unnecessary. Yeah. The phone rings and Kathy picks up. I guess Father Delaney was trying to call her back. And when she picks it up, it's nothing but a dial tone. Now, George is um, parking his bike at the aforementioned bar where he is meeting up with Jeff for a couple of beers. And then the bartender says something really creepy. He kind of looks at George with a start. And, you know, George is wondering what's going on. The bartender says, Jesus, I'm sorry. It's just that you look like that kid. He was sitting right in that seat when he was arrested. And George says, what are you talking about? And the bartender says, the kid last year that killed his family. You know, that house down by the river. You're the spitting image. And at that point, George is kind of freaked out. And he attempts to leave, but Jeff stops him. And Jeff says, we've got to talk right now. The business is falling apart. People are calling. Bills have to be paid. And if you don't care, well, I do. And George is just, he's so fed up. He's like, stop pushing, Jeff. I don't have the patience for this right now. I find this part of it very, very interesting because I think that it's one of the moments of truth in this entire thing. And I think that it has just a wee bit to do with what really was going on here. Right. Jeff says, you marry a dame with three kids, take on a big house with mortgages up to your ass, change your religion and forget about business. Great. Just great. There's more to it than that, but that's a good outline yeah. for what's going on here. So, of course, George has had it at this point, and he just literally clocks this guy. Oh, this would go over really, really well in 2022. <laughs> <laughs> but the funny thing is that when he does it, it kind of snaps him back to reality. He's like, oh, what the fuck am I doing here? Yeah. And it is the reality check that he needs to bring him around and start being a little bit more rational. A little bit, not much. Mm -hmm. And it's going to go flying out the window in a couple of seconds here. But to all of a sudden, things are calm. They're rational. Everyone is talking, which is something in this situation. But then we cut back to Amy, who is singing Jesus Loves Me. Blech. Oh, who needs to hear that? 
Kathy walks in and Amy says that she scared Jody walking in the room. So Kathy asks her, where is Jody? And Amy says she went out the window. And now for the next thing that fucked me up as a kid, a pair of red bodiless eyes in the night right outside Amy's bedroom window. And of course, now Kathy is terrified. She's starting to believe that there's some serious shit happening in this house. Now we go back to George, who is spilling the beans to Jeff about all the crazy shit that's been happening. And Carolyn, that's Jeff's wife or girlfriend or whatever she is to him, starts spinning this yarn about a dude named John Ketchum who escaped the Salem witch trials and apparently settled on the site of the house. Yeah. She says they ran him out of Salem for being a witch. Um, people, this happened to exactly no one. In fact, when accused witches fled Salem, they were typically followed and brought back to stand trial. Right. No one was banished from the colony right. for being a witch. They dealt with things right then and there and put a noose around their neck. Right. That was how they dealt with it. But... Of course, George, not being the Massachusetts colony historian by any means, is starting to really eat this up. And he's showing more interest than he probably should at this point, because all it does is add fuel to Carolyn's fire and she just keeps going. And she points at George and says, this guy is living on some special land. Now, not only are we going to talk about some dude who escaped the Salem witch trials, now we're going to add, quote unquote, nutsy Indians sacrifices and devil worshippers to the mix here. And now Jeff chimes in trying so hard to be the voice of reason. He says, will you two get a grip on yourselves? You sound like a couple of weirdos. <laughs> and here's most of the problem with any kind of thinking that moves in this direction. Because if you think like Carolyn does with this next line, you're kind of doomed. Okay. Yeah. She says, don't be such a hardcore rationalist. Not everything can be explained with a slide rule. Well, that's true, but there are other avenues of explanation for a lot of things. And you don't have to default to, quote, Nazi Indians, sacrifices, devil worshipers, or escapees from the Massachusetts colony. You don't yeah. have to default to these things either. No. So Jeff tells George to get Kathy out of the house for a few hours. You know, nice dinner, a little relaxation. And Jeff and Carolyn will watch the kids. And then after that, once cooler heads have started to prevail, the grownups can talk about all this. Of course, Carolyn really doesn't like the house. And this is the second time it's giving her bad vibes. And, you know, she's not helping the situation at all. But she's starting to feel this pull to actually go into the house. So now George and Jeff and Carolyn are back at the house and Kathy tells George about the eyes outside the window. And even on the heels of all of this, George dismisses it. He says it was probably a cat, but Kathy's not buying it. She's seen too much. And now we see Carolyn checking out the basement because she's quote unquote sensitive mm. to spirit. I was told that I was a sensitive yeah. also. But this self-proclaimed sensitive is now going down to the basement where the dog is still scratching at the wall until his poor paws have started to bleed. Mm. And now she starts adding more details. It's like, how many scary stories are there that are connected just to this house? And she starts going off on this part of it now. She says, there was a tribe of Indians called the Shinnecocks, and they used this land as a sort of exposure pen. They put all the crazy people here and left them here to die. What story is it? Yeah. Did some so... dude escape from Salem? Was it an Indian burial ground or whatever the hell it was? Nazi sacrifices and devil worshippers? Or is it this? There are so many things that they're trying desperately to tie this yeah. property to. It's like throw it against the wall. See which one sticks. Yeah, pretty much. And now her attention, of course, is shifting to where the dog has been scratching. And she says, my God, that's where it is. There are people buried here. And goes and picks up a sledgehammer and starts hacking at the wall yeah. in someone else's house. Yeah. She's claiming that there's a secret room behind the wall right there where the dog is. She's got no proof, but she knows that it's there. And so I guess George decides, well, if someone's going to fuck up my house, it's going to be me. He <laughs> takes the mallet and starts hacking at the same part of the wall and I'm thinking, this is awesome. I mean, what damage might you be doing here? Don't you need a fucking permit for this before you just start hacking away? Yeah. A really, really small number of blows later. 
And there it is, the infamous Red Room that also gave me the heebie-jeebies back in the day. Oh, yeah. And even though there doesn't seem to be anything in there, everyone is freaking out. George kind of sees his own reflection. It's kind of like Luke in the uh, in the cave yeah. in Empire. He sees his own face sort of looking back at him for a second. I think that that is supposed to be the answer to, you know, you look so much like the dude who killed his family. Yeah. So he's seeing the killer in there, but I don't see anything else until Carolyn starts back in with all of her woo rificness and she basically screams that it's the passage to hell. Okay. This suburban home in Long Island is the passage to hell. Really convenient to the mouth of hell. Oh God, yeah. MST fans, she'll get that one probably. So now another phone call to Father Delaney who appears to just be going batshit. He picks up the phone, dial tone. Kathy is trying desperately to get a hold of him. It's not happening. Whatever's going on in this house is not letting it happen. And I'm sitting there thinking, there's Jody just sort of off there in the shadows somewhere saying, sorry, Kathy, but you ain't calling no priest on our time. (laughs) Kathy is still talking about the red room and the voices and all of that. And then the camera pans back over to the crucifix on the wall, which is now hanging upside down. Mm. George grabs it because it must be good protection if the spirits in the house can just flip it at will. Mm. You know, I'm sure that they're afraid of it. So he grabs it and, uh uh-oh, seems a little hot or at least uncomfortable to handle. Right. So he drops it, and I think just momentarily, but he drops it. And now they're going through the house, basically trying to exercise the place. George seems to be finding a little bit more religion than he bargained for here. And I'm thinking, yeah, just keep walking around and claiming this place for Jesus, because that's just worked out so well up to now. Yeah. Kathy is looking in the mirror, and she has these odd blotches on her face, And I'm not sure what the imagery was there. I think maybe it was that the heat from the crucifix burned her skin, or at least in this fever dream state that George seems to be in, that's what he's seeing, something like that. But we cut to another conversation between Father Bolin and Father Delaney, and he's still trying to talk him down. And Bolin says that we create demons in our own minds. And he's right. That's where it all originates. But Delaney is not hearing it. He's determined. They're in the sanctuary of this church. And I thought that he was going to be saying a mass. I thought that that was going to be his his next solution to this was to say a mass for the house and what's going on there. But he's just basically praying. And his prayers echo through the empty sanctuary. And as he prays, at least from his perspective of things, Some of the statuary starts to crumble. I don't think that it was. No, it wasn't. It was all hallucination on his part. But the harder he prayed, the more these things started to crumble. Yeah. And then Delaney tells Bolin that he's gone blind. In the midst of all of this, now he can't see. So now we're up to day number 18. It's uh, Thursday night, and George hears a kind of thumping somewhere in the house and goes to investigate. He gets downstairs, rounds the corner into the living room, and of course, there's nothing there. Now he's just, he's had it. He is standing there in the middle of his living room screaming, what do you want from us? This is my house. So he does what anyone would do in this situation. He starts rolling out a big rug. That'll help. I'm not sure what that was about. I don't know. But Kathy stirs and goes looking for George, who is from her perspective of things, in the midst of hacking up Amy with an axe. So when George turns and goes after her, she starts awake. It was just a nightmare. Again. Yeah. But George is losing it. Maybe part of what spurred on the nightmare was him downstairs screaming. And the next part of this is him just wailing that he's coming apart. Kathy comes in. She's obviously relieved that this was a dream. But she hears what's going on and comes running and George tells Kathy that he's okay. Now, this moments after all this screaming and wailing and for reasons unknown, she just accepts it. And it's at this point where Kathy finally suggests leaving. And George lashes back at her and says that they're there because she wanted the house. So she should shut up. She calls him a bastard and he clocks her. And then in the midst of all of this, he just goes back to building the fire because it's always cold in there. And that's his priority. 
Kathy finally decides that she's taking matters into her own hands and she's going to go to the church to look for Father Delaney. She gets there and Bolin tells her that he's on vacation. He's not there. And at this point, he actually is not. And she reluctantly leaves. Again, no resolution to any of this. And for whatever reason, the cops are watching the Lutzes and also keeping tabs on the priests, Bolin in particular. Mm. Not sure what this is all about, but, you know, they're kind of staking out people that have been involved in this situation so far. And none of this ever happened. We follow the police following Bolin on his way to go see Father Delaney. I don't know what this place is, but it's gorgeous. Is it a mental hospital, like a real high-end kind of mental facility? It's probably some sort of seminary. Yeah, yeah, it looks very Catholic. Yeah. It definitely does. But it's gorgeous. If I needed to clear my head, this is the type of place that I would like to go. (laughs) But Delaney is just sort of sitting there on a bench. And he is clearly going crazy. He still thinks that he's blind. He's not responding to anything. He's just sort of staring out into space like he's catatonic at that point. And it's like Bolin isn't even there at that point. After a bit, Bolin kind of gives up. And leaves in silence. He takes one look back at Father Delaney and he's looking pretty fucking pathetic. And it is kind of sad to see what he's going through. But then one of the cops, a guy named Sergeant Gianfrido, approaches him and starts questioning Bolin about Delaney. And the conversation really doesn't make a lot of sense. Gianfrido looks over the ledge and sees Father Delaney just sitting there staring off into space. There's some weird little conversation that goes on here, but it really doesn't amount to anything. That's the way they end the scene, which I think is a little bit odd, but not really for this movie. (laughs) So now Kathy is at the library herself. She is looking at old microfiche slides of old newspapers, and she gets a look at the guy who killed the family in the house. And yep, this dude looks just like George. Mm. And... My thought there is July 4th, 1921 ball, anyone? Yeah. Very end of The Shining. You've always been the caretaker. Yeah. Does that mean that George has always been the killer? Yeah, no. no. Of course not. No. And now Kathy is coming home and ironically on a road called the LIE or Long Island Expressway. <laughs> and we get another stormy night. This is the last night they're going to be in the house. So of course the storm has to be raging and the wind has to be blowing and the thunder and lightning have to be roiling and all of that. So Kathy is still mulling all this over in her head and she can't get this image of the killer who looks exactly like her husband out of her head. She's yelling after George who is not responding. And then she sees him outside with an ax He's outside looking up into Amy's bedroom, and there's the thing with the red eyes in the window. George is calling after Amy, who is not responding. He's back in the house and still calling her with the axe in his hand. The kids, of course, are terrified. The walls are now oozing blood, and the kids are barricaded in the bathroom while George goes full Jack Torrance trying to get the door open. And he's doing so in full Jack Torrance style by hacking away at it with the axe. Mm. So Kathy jumps him and almost gets herself killed in the process. But I mean, there's like all of these things are happening. Concrete is cracking. Windows are shattering. There's like earthquake level shaking going on. The Lutzes are gathering up the kids and bugging out. But of course they forgot about the dog. So George now stops the van and goes running back to the house. I mean, this is like Poltergeist a few years later where they have to stop the car and let E-Buzz in. You know what I mean? (laughs) And if there's one rule of life that everyone in horror movies follows, it's this one. You never leave the dog behind for a couple of reasons, but mostly because it does manage to further the plot. And this little move costs him. He's back in the basement and the floor gives way. And he falls into that tarry shit that they found earlier. Basically, he's standing over a sinkhole and he falls in. He comes up, but he's like coated in all this shit. And Harry doesn't recognize him immediately. and He starts snarling at him. But I guess when he hears his voice, the dog figures out who he is. And he's like, oh, shit, I need to help. And Harry starts pulling George out of the hole to safety. Good boy, Harry. You did good. They really do spend more time than I think they ever needed to on this whole dog rescue thing. 
but good boy Harry. You know, you're you're the real hero of this movie now. <laughs> And that is basically the way that it ends. It's a little bit more anticlimactic than the end of Poltergeist. I, I oh, feel like yeah. they could have done a little bit more with this. Mm -hmm. But it's very, very, very similar to the way that movie ended. Toby Hooper and Steven Spielberg just had a better handle on filmmaking, I think. But that is the uneventful way that this movie ends. At the end, we get the animal house close for this movie. It says George and Kathleen Lutz and their family never reclaimed their house or their personal belongings. Not entirely true. And it says today they live in another state. Um, what state is that exactly? Reality? <laughs> so that is how it ends with rescuing the dog and the house kind of watching them leave. Okay, very anticlimactic and not at all scary. I'm sorry. There was nothing scary about this, like, at all. No. When, when you're nine, yeah. But yeah. watching it now, yeah. This was not what I would really consider to be a scary movie. It's a movie that tries to be scary, but overuses all of its tropes. And it's also the victim of some really, really bad filmmaking. So there are a few problems here that I want to address. And all of this comes from the wiki. And we're talking about things that are in the movie and things that were in the book that they were later able to prove to be untrue. For starters, they changed the names of all the priests that were involved. And in honesty, there was really only one or two that had any contact with the Lutzes whatsoever. The role of Father Pecorero, who is Father Mancuso in the book, they changed so many things around has been given considerable attention. During the course of the lawsuit surrounding the case in the late 1970s, Father Pecorero stated in an affidavit that his only contact with the Lutzes concerning the matter had been by telephone. And yes, he was actually able to talk to them. Other accounts say that Father Pecorero did visit the house, but experienced nothing unusual there. Someone might have gone to the house to bless it, but it was uneventful. In 1979, Father Pecorero, or someone who was supposed to be Father Pecorero, mm -hmm. appearing in silhouette, described his experience while blessing the Amityville house during an interview for the television series In Search Of. In the interview, he makes it clear that he did in fact enter the home and that he was slapped by an invisible force and told to get out by a disembodied voice. Was this the dude or was it somebody that they planted? because it made for better television. Who knows? <laughs> so my question obviously is, was it really him? I mean, come on. If they wouldn't show his face, who even knows if this was really him? I'll take an affidavit over a TV producer's interpretation of things any day. And we have an affidavit. So there's that. Also, the claims of physical damage to the locks, doors, and windows were rejected by Jim and Barbara Cromarty, who bought the house for... $55,000, the equivalent of 246 k in 2021, so still not cheap, but right. definitely cheap for that area. They bought the house in March of 1977. Barbara Cromarty argued that upon inspecting the doors and locks and everything, that they all appeared to be original items and had not seemed to be broken or repaired. The Cromartys also revealed that the red room in question was nothing but a small closet in the basement and would have been known to the previous owners of the house because it was not concealed in any way. Now, you can say, well, he hacked away at all the bricks around it, but you would have seen evidence of that. And yeah. all it was was a room. Nothing strange or special about it other than the fact that it was painted red and who knows why. <laughs> and that was it. The claim made in Chapter 11 of the book that the house was built on a site where the local Shinnecock Indians had once abandoned the mentally ill and the dying was rejected by local Native American leaders. So, big yeah. fat lie, but we knew this already. Mm. Then there's a claim in the book of cloven hoof prints in the snow on January 1st, 1976. This was rejected by researchers Rick Moran and Peter Jordan, whose investigation revealed that there had been no snowfall at that time. Yeah. Neighbors reported nothing unusual during the time that the Lutzes were living there. There's a citation needed here, so who knows if any of them were even interviewed. But if there was shit going on in that house, you would think the neighbors would have at least noticed and had something to say. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they really didn't tells me a lot. Police officers are depicted visiting the house in the book and in the 1979 film, 
but records showed that the Lutzes did not call the police during the period that they were living on Ocean Avenue. There was no bar in Amityville called the Witch's Brew at the time either. That was more creative license that they decided would make for better filmmaking, especially in the context of the subject matter. Critics, including Stephen Kaplan, have pointed out that changes were made to the book as it was reprinted in different editions. They pulled a Mike Warnke (laughs) and kept changing things. In the original hardcover edition, Father Pecorero's car is, quote, an old tan Ford, and he experiences an incident in which the hood flies up against the windshield while he's driving it. In later editions, the car is described as a Chevy Vega before reverting back to a Ford. In May of 1977, George and Kathy Lutz filed a lawsuit against William Weber, the defense lawyer for Ronald DeFeo Jr. at his trial. Also named were Paul Hoffman, a writer working on the account of the hauntings, Bernard Burton and Frederick Mars, both alleged clairvoyants who had examined the house, along with Good Housekeeping magazine, the New York Sunday News, and the Hearst Corporation. Talk about trying to cash in. The Lutzes alleged misappropriation of names for trade purposes, invasion of privacy, and mental distress. You told the story. Where's the invasion of privacy here? Yeah. Okay, this is your fucking story. And if this is going to bother you that much, here's an idea. Don't go to the media with fabrications about evil spirits in your house, and no one will invade your privacy. But that's where I think all of this was headed. I think that this was part of their plan when they decided that they wanted out of the house. And I'll get to that in just a second. The claims against the news corporations were dropped and the remainder of the lawsuit was heard by Brooklyn U.S. District Court Judge Jack B. Weinstein in September 1979, at which time he dismissed the Lutz's claims. In the September 17, 1979 issue of People magazine, William Weber wrote this, He said, I know this book is a hoax. We created this horror story over many bottles of wine. This refers to a meeting that Weber is said to have had with George and Kathy Lutz, during which time they discussed what would later become the outline of Jay Anson's book. Judge Weinstein also expressed concern about the conduct of William Weber and Bernard Burton relating to the affair, stating, quote, there is a very serious ethical question when lawyers become literary agents. Hmm. Very true. George Lutz maintained that events in the book were, quote, mostly true. Another Mike Warnke yeah. angle here. In June of 1979, George and Kathy Lutz took a polygraph test relating to their experiences in the house. The polygraph tests were performed by Chris Gugas and Michael Rice, who at the time were reportedly among the top five polygraph experts in America. The results, in Rice's opinion, did not indicate lying. Now, I do find this part interesting, because either it means that they believed what they were saying, or they were such good con people that they were able to circumvent a polygraph. And you can fool a polygraph if you know how. It's difficult, but it's not impossible. So either they believed their own story, which I doubt, or they knew how to get past a polygraph, which I also doubt, which leaves me to believe that they just got lucky. Yeah. And something didn't register that should have registered, and it was never picked up on, so... It looked like they were telling the truth. Another possibility that I don't think is probable is that they paid them off. Yeah. That could have been a thing too, but I don't think it's likely not with these two. Okay. (laughs) You know, someone from your local police department, maybe you could grease them a little bit, but when you've got people who have names in this line of research, they're probably not going to succumb to a bribe. In October, 2000, the history channel broadcast two specials, Amityville, The Haunting and Amityville Horror or Hoax. This was a two-part documentary made by horror screenwriter and producer Daniel Farrens. The debate about the accuracy of the Amityville horror continues. The various owners of the house since the Lutz family left in 1976 have publicly reported no problems while living there. James Cromarty, who bought the house in 1977 and lived there with his wife Barbara for 10 years, commented this, He said nothing weird ever happened except for people coming by because of the book and the movie. That was it. So here's what I think happened here. 
I think that these people bought a gorgeous house on a gorgeous plot of land and got it for a song because some people were murdered in the house. They moved in and immediately started noticing issues with the house. At least in the movie, they're told in the process of making the decision to buy the house that it's a bit of a, quote, fixer-upper. And the next owners got the house for 30K less, 25 or 30K less. So, uh, yeah, that's what happens when you've got an older house that needs work. And it needed work when they moved in. Right. And I think that they realized in short form that maintaining and repairing the house was going to sap anything they had saved on the purchase price. And they were looking at the possibility of being house poor, and they didn't like that very much. They started making all kinds of crazy claims, and the whole spectral damage thing might have been some kind of ploy to cash in on the insurance. I don't know. It's all speculation. Amy probably did have an imaginary friend. I mean, because a lot of kids do. But the thing is that if this was a real thing, it was also a very convenient conveyance for all the rest of these demonic details. They could put it all on the shoulders of this thing that their daughter called Jody. Right. Okay. And just a quick observation about how badly put together this movie was. There were points in this movie where I felt like I was watching a version of The Shining made by a high school film class. Okay. <laughs> we have the madman with an axe. We have said madman hacking down a bathroom door. We have an invisible child that latches onto another child. We have a killer that looks just like another killer. And again, the whole you've always been the caretaker thing kind of shot into my head with this. But here's the thing. The novel The Shining that only includes some of this came out in 1977 and the movie came out in 1981. So they probably didn't borrow any details here. Okay. I think the filmmakers in both instances just latched onto a few good horror tropes and ran with them. Now, just like with In Search Of, my thoughts here are based only on theory and conjecture, but I do think that this version of things makes a lot more sense. I'm sure I got a few elements right, but if not, they had other reasons why they flat out didn't want to stay there. It seems like an unnecessarily elaborate ruse. Why not just sell the place? Answer? They ultimately lost 25K on the sale and they knew they would, hence all the hype. It was a means of recouping losses and getting a fresh start. I also want to comment on one of the major things that I think made this movie popular. And it had nothing to do with good filmmaking or storytelling because this movie has neither. I think it had way more to do with the message that God wasn't more powerful than the spirits slash demons, ghosts, whatever you want to call them, that had control over that house. They thwarted any religious effort to quell them at every turn. We saw this in The Exorcist, too. The demon didn't want to go running from Reagan at the first sign of a crucifix, either. This kind of messaging set the stage for real fear in the hearts of many. Because if these demons couldn't be controlled by priests, and if they could go so far as to stand in the way of religious intervention, what is anyone's faith actually worth? If anything, this was a good message in the context of things supernatural being real and how religious hocus pocus has limited domain over them. But a lot of people believed it because they had faith and because they considered the plausibility of these things having happened to be at least moderate. Even though people almost immediately started trying to set the record straight, it didn't really matter because at the end of the day, people are going to believe what they want. If you want to believe in a world where demons are real and your faith may or may not have any dominion over them, that is your choice. I think it makes far more sense to question, get the facts, and go from there. And the fact is that nothing that happened at 112 Ocean Avenue on the supernatural side of things has ever been proven, and quite to the contrary, much of it has been debunked. The Lutzes are now both deceased, and prior to, they divorced sometime in the late 80s. That's where their story ends. But this one endures, and to this day, you will see the words, A True Story, as part of the title of this book. I think we can all take our cues from the people who bought the house after, and the subsequent owners, none of whom ever experienced anything out of the ordinary there. If you buy a haunted house... Knowing in your mind that it's all a lot of hooey, chances are that the demons aren't going to bother you. Imagine that. This is why I always say that belief in a lot of contexts is dangerous and why proof is a necessary element to anything we experience or think we experience. 
And the truth of the matter is that stately old house is just that. It's a house. Yes, bad things happen there, but that's true of a lot of houses. Probably even ours. Our house was built in the 1950s, so somewhere along the line someone might have died here. We don't know, and the ghosts ain't talking. So with that in mind, understand that belief is a choice. Facts are far more reliable, and the facts that refute the Lutz's story of what happened in the Amityville house are overwhelming. If anything at all, the Amityville horror teaches us the unending importance of seeking the truth wherever it leads. And spoiler alert, it doesn't lead to fake stories about drafty rooms, broken doors, red-eyed demons, or hoof prints in snow that never fell. Whenever you're faced with the choice between blind belief and taking the time to discover the truth, the latter may be more time-consuming. It may even be a little disappointing at times, but ultimately what it does is takes you to a place where you're that much closer to getting and staying unbound. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Unbound. Show topics are chosen based on their timeliness, relevance, and social impact. Have suggestions for future topics? Email us at unbound.podcast.network at gmail.com with all your comments and feedback. Please don't forget to like, share, and throw a few five-star ratings our way and follow us on all major social platforms. And don't forget to hit subscribe if you haven't already. Links to our social pages as well as a full list of cited sources in today's episode are listed in the show notes available at our website, getunbound.org. That's get-unbound.org. If you value this resource and would like to see it continue, please consider supporting us on Patreon at the link in the show description. And be sure to check for new updates every Sunday when we'll come together again and take one more step toward getting and staying unbound. Unbound.